Do metabolites cause muscle growth? In 2017, Dankel and colleagues published a review questioning a long-held belief in muscle physiology that metabolites like lactate, hydrogen ions, and inorganic phosphate are direct drivers of muscle hypertrophy. While these byproducts of fatigue are certainly elevated during hypertrophy-induced training, the review proposed a more nuanced view. They suggest that metabolites might not be anabolic signals themselves, but instead contribute to muscle growth indirectly by increasing fatigue and forcing the recruitment of more muscle fibers during exercise. Interestingly, earlier that same year, the same research group had already put this idea to the test. They designed a study to isolate the effect of metabolites without the confounding influence of further muscle contraction. Rather than applying blood flow restriction during exercise, as it's typically done, they applied it after a single high load set. The goal was to trap the metabolites inside the muscle and see whether the environment alone could stimulate additional growth. Now, I'll go over the exact protocols more thoroughly when I describe the method section. This study offered a unique opportunity to examine a key theoretical claim in hypertrophy literature, which is are metabolites anabolic on their own, or do they only matter when combined with muscular work? The purpose of the study was to determine whether applying blood flow restriction after high load resistance training exercise could augment or improve muscle growth, independent of additional muscle contractions. So let's take a look at the methods. Well, this study included two components, a pilot study and a full training study. The pilot study involved 14 resistance trained individuals. Each person performed one set of bicep curls to failure at 70% of their one rep max. One arm was assigned to a post-exercise blood flow restriction condition where the cuff was inflated to around 70% arterial occlusion pressure for three minutes. And the other arm was a control. Muscle torque was measured before, immediately after, and again, three minutes after exercise to determine how blood flow restriction affected short-term recovery. Now, this process essentially allowed the researchers to verify that metabolite accumulation actually occurred in the blood flow restriction condition. Now, for those wondering how torque is actually measured in resistance training studies, the researchers often use specialized equipment called isokinetic dynamometers. This device allows participants to exert force against a lever, either through a controlled movement or in a fixed position to assess torque produced by a specific muscle group. Now, the main training study included 16 untrained participants. Six were male and seven were female. Over eight weeks, the participants completed 24 sessions in total, involving one set of bicep curls to failure three times per week. Each person used both arms with one randomly assigned to the control condition, which was the exercise only group, and then the other was to the experimental condition, which included the exercise immediately followed by three minutes of blood flow restriction. Both arms used 70% of their one rep max, and the exercise was controlled with a metronome for one second for the concentric phase and one second for the eccentric phase. Now for the training study, muscle thickness was measured with ultrasound at three sites of the upper arm. 50%, 60%, and 70% of the distance from the elbow to the shoulder, and both before and after the training period. Additional measures the researchers were interested in also included a one rep max strength, training volume, repetitions completed, and ratings of discomfort. So let's take a look at the results. What did the researchers find? Well, in the pilot study, torque remained suppressed three minutes after training in the blood flow restriction condition, but it returned to baseline in the control condition. This suggests that BFR successfully delayed recovery, which is likely due to the pooled metabolites or increased fatigue. Now, this proof of concept was really important to know before moving on to the training intervention. Now, in the training study, both arms performed the same number of sets, reps, and overall training volume. But when it came to hypertrophy, the results differed. At the 60% measurement site, the control arm experienced a significant increase in muscle thickness from 3.1 to 3.3 centimeters, while the BFR arm showed no change. It remained at 3.1 centimeters. 
So this indicated a possible attenuation of growth when BFR was applied post-exercise. Now at the 50 and 70% sites, group level differences weren't statistically different, but individual analysis revealed that more participants in the control condition showed meaningful increases in muscle size. When broken down by sex, the attenuation in the blood flow restriction condition appeared to be more pronounced in females, although the study wasn't powered to definitively test this difference. Now, in terms of strength, both arms improved their one rep max over time, and no differences were found between either of the conditions. Likewise, there were no significant differences in total training volume or the number of repetitions completed. However, participants consistently reported more discomfort in the BFR condition, particularly in the one to three minutes following exercise. So what does this study really tell us? Well, the most important takeaway from this study is the fact that it provides experimental evidence that metabolites alone without muscle contraction do not appear to enhance muscle growth. Even though BFR was applied immediately after training, which effectively traps these fatigue-related metabolites in the muscle, there was no added benefit to hypertrophy. In fact, at one measurement site, growth appeared to be attenuated in the blood flow restriction condition compared to the control. So this challenges the popular belief that simply creating a higher metabolite environment is enough to drive muscle growth. It supports a more refined idea that metabolites may only contribute to hypertrophy when they are able to increase muscle activation, like during low load or fatiguing training. But when there's no muscle contraction, just metabolite accumulation, those same byproducts don't seem to provide any anabolic signal. There are also some physiological explanations worth considering. Restricting blood flow after a heavy set may actually interfere with our early recovery process. Muscle contraction during training helps manage oxidative stress and facilitates nutrient delivery. But applying BFR post-exercise might actually block that recovery window, possibly increasing stress to a level that's no longer helpful or mildly detrimental. That said, we should be cautious not to overinterpret the findings that muscle size was reduced in the post-exercise BFR condition at one site only. That outcome could reflect normal measurement variability, especially given the small sample size and the modest changes observed. The authors also noted that discomfort was higher in the blood flow restriction condition and that female participants appeared more affected, though this study wasn't designed to analyze sex differences. Ultimately, this study adds to the growing body of evidence suggesting that muscle contraction and mechanical tension remain the key drivers of hypertrophy and that metabolic stress, while potentially helpful in certain training contexts, such as low load training, doesn't signal growth on its own. So what is the big takeaway? Well, applying blood flow restriction after high load resistance training doesn't seem to help. In fact, it might even slightly interfere with muscle growth. This study shows that simply pooling metabolites in the muscle post-exercise without any additional muscle contractions or reps performed does not appear to promote hypertrophy. If anything, it reinforces what we've seen in other research, that metabolites are not anabolic on their own. Their potential role in muscle growth likely depends on how they influence muscle activation and fatigue during exercise and not after it's over. And while one site showed a slight reduction in muscle size with post-exercise BFR, that difference was small and could easily fall within the margin of measurement error, so it shouldn't be overstated. The bottom line is this, if you're already lifting with sufficient load and training close to failure, adding BFR after your set doesn't offer any benefit and it may just add discomfort without any payoff. Regardless, I think that these scientists designed this study not to offer a new way to train, but to test the influence of metabolites on muscle growth. So that's all I have for you today, folks. Thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful or interesting, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel for more science-based training content, and drop me a comment. Have you ever tried BFR in your own training? And finally, for more details about one-on-one -on -one coaching, my workout at BFit, books, my research review, or my other products and services, please take a look at the links in the description below, and I'll see you in my next video.